much for coming out today on this uh, cold and rainy day, and thank you for being here at the Berkeley Center. Um, this lecture is part of our Religion, Ethics, and World Affairs lecture series that we um, try to do at least two events a semester for our students. Um, and um, we're very excited about this conversation today. I'm going to introduce um, Paul Manuel, who is a distinguished scholar in residence at American University and a um, research fellow here at the Berkeley Center. Um, he has authored and co-authored nine books and numerous scholarly articles, um, including a book on faith-based organizations and social welfare. Um, and he is going to introduce our speaker today and moderate the conversation. And we will go for about 45 minutes to um, an hour, and then we'll open it up for <coughs> questions. If anybody has a question at the end of the talk, just raise your hand, and I'll bring you a mic. And welcome, everyone, and thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Of course, my proudest accomplishment in my career is that I actually sat in Tom's moral theology class in the fall of 1997. Um, and so that was the highlight of, uh, that we, we had a good class. You were the oldest student in the room. Oldest, and we had some interesting discussions about John Rawls and some other things at that time. Um, so many of you know Tom. Uh, he's a professor of moral theology now at Fordham University, a uh, Jesuit province formerly of the New England province, now of the Northeast province. He served as professor of moral theology at the Western Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge and then also at Boston College. His doctorate is in moral theology from Emory, um, and he's the author of, uh, of nine books and many, many scholarly articles. Um, what we want, would like to do today is talk a little bit about the intellectual history of the project that we've engaged on Pope Francis, and then um, uh, turn this into more of a conversation than a, than a formal talk. And uh, so we have some questions that we've developed around Tom's thinking on the Pope and his Jesuit charism. Um, it started with uh, this work, um, Pope Francis uh, as a Global Actor, where politics and theology meets. And this project actually was born exactly in this room three years ago when uh, my colleagues and I, so Alina Lyon from University of New Hampshire and Christine Gustafson of St. Asim College and I were launching another project on religion and politics in the Portuguese-speaking world, where we were wondering how that, that no nature of sort of culture and religion and politics interacted in a, in a particular uh, cultural space. And throughout the conversation we had that day, every other question was about Pope Francis. Everything. Um, and so we left thinking, Francis deserves some treatment. And it has to be an interdisciplinary treatment, uh, political scientists, and also uh, theologians and historians and others to see what we can discern about this very compelling pope. So that led to a series of meetings, uh, uh, conferences, and discussions that ultimately led to this. And Tom became very important in, in helping us think it through and about uh, the pope's Jesuit charism. And we have our first pope who's a Jesuit. But it's not the Jesuit piece is obviously very important. We're going to discuss that in a moment. But he's also Latin American, and that becomes important. And even more specifically, he's Argentinian, and that becomes even more important. When we begin to figure out uh, his Jesuit formation um, and his embrace of uh, the theology of the people. And as we uh, sort of began to unpack all of it, we began to understand why there's so much confusion around this individual, who in fact is incredibly complicated and is also not that complicated when you understand his story. But understanding the story takes some doing. And so this is what we're trying to do today. So that's sort of the intellectual history. Uh, Tom had a chapter in this one about the Jesuit uh, background. And then it led naturally into this. So this is more political science -y, And this is more moral theology, um, which is what the conversation is going to be today. So that's sort of the intellectual background. So with that, we'll start with some questions. I'll pose questions to, to Tom. And then uh, we'll go through this. And then we'll open it up uh, to the crowd. So Tom. First question I have for you is that it may seem that Pope Francis is very old news today. It might seem that way. It's been a while, the excitement's off, there's been other things that have been happening. Do you think it's still worth paying attention to him? Okay, so a really good agenda item for me is to remind people of the excitement that you experienced, if it's all, at all like mine, on March 13th, 2013, when a new pope was elected, uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, remember where you were and what, what your feelings were at that time. He's a Jesuit, he's an Argentinian, Latin American. Um, 
the energy that we, at least I could speak for myself, that I received at that moment, I was highly charged, the expectations for what he would do. I think we've lost a little bit of that energy, and then there's some probably good reasons and maybe some bad reasons for that. Just to make a little distinction at the start, though. What a pope does is internal church matters, and that would, right now we're rather uh, uh, concerned about getting the church's house in order. It's a really important, maybe the most important agenda item on the sex abuse crisis, on a number of other things about the Curia and the Vatican Bank. So the internal church agenda. But I was hoping in my book and in what I've worked with the political scientists like Paul on is to focus people's attention also on the very important external church matters, things beyond the boundaries of the church. So Catholic social teaching, our century plus long effort to talk about social justice, again, outside the church barriers, establishing the legitimacy of a church voice, a pope, groups of bishops, lay people, addressing issues of social justice that are external to the church, the wider pluralistic society with an interreligious dimension. <laughs> so in the chapters of that book that I wrote, Mercy in Action, just in the things that you see Pope Francis doing, you could go through a really good checklist, and I hope you still have energy around these things. I do, and I'm quite sure that Pope Francis does. His teachings on economic inequality, his teachings on labor justice, his teachings on ecology, the great encyclical Laudato Si from 2015, his teachings on family life in a time of great challenge, his uh, apostolic exhortation Amoris Laetitia from 2016 about the health of family lives, his teachings on refugees, migrants, people who are trafficked, his great social concern for peace, especially strong teachings when he addressed the UN in New York and the uh, Congress here in this city of Washington about the global arms trade and many other diplomatic initiatives. That's a little checklist. It's an outline of the chapters of my book, Mercy in Action, reminding us how much of an external message that Pope Francis has. So let's talk about that. Um, we know that the theology of the people that he helped develop in Argentina is something he brought with him to Rome something that was maybe not well understood, but we increasingly understand it. And namely, maybe its emphasis on concrete outcomes over abstract thinking, or on popular devotion over uh, sort of formal uh, teachings of the church. So he goes to the people. And that's something that we've heralded as distinctive. But do you think it's really that new? I mean, we've had other popes in the past that have also liked concrete realities over abstract ideas. And we've had other popes that have liked popular devotion. So is there something really new in his way and in his teaching that, um, that's distinctive? Uh, really good question. So besides the kind of frisson of energy, the renewal of Catholic social teaching, the renewed urgency of social justice initiatives, Pope Francis has added the theology of the people and the Latin American perspective. And it's not, I mean, uh, people play with these ideas. Is, or is theology of the people, Teohila del Pueblo, the Argentinian variant of liberation theology, which more, which has its real intellectual roots with Gustavo Gutierrez, who's a Peruvian, the Brazilian school of liberation theology, and the Central American, John Sabrino, <coughs> Ignacio A. Correa. I want to make a distinction. The theology of the people is a methodology. I usually lose my undergraduate students when I use the word methodology, but I think this distinguished, distinguished audience can stay with me. It's a way of approaching theology that is, uh, as Paul suggested in a phrase or two, let me expand it, uh, bottom up, uh, working by induction rather than deduction from categories. So it does bear similarities to the other part, the other Latin American schools of thought like liberation theology, but it's a very distinctive um, approach. Pope Francis is not a philosopher interested in abstractions. He's been called a personalist uh, I don't think he embraces that term uh, explicitly very often. But as John Paul II was a personalist, a preference for looking into the well-being of people, especially people of limited means, low income, marginalized, excluded from the world economy. So it does have a, a, a similarity to a family of approaches to theology and social theory, 
that is in the same family as liberation theology, but it takes explicit, uh, it makes explicit connections to uh, the experience of people, the religious devotion. His signature phrase, I, how I long for a church of the poor and for the poor. The poor have much to teach us. If we grasp onto those sentences and don't forget them, we will avoid the, the pitfalls of, of categorizing or caricaturing Pope Francis in some philosophical school that doesn't really fit. OK, so the so what question. Uh, the Jesuit order has been around over 400 years. It's taken a long time to get a Jesuit pope. So the first question would be, why did it take so long? And secondly, now that we have one, what difference does it make? The so what question. I'll start with some anecdotes. Uh, Jesuits are not supposed to be popes. We're not even supposed to be bishops or cardinals. It's only by way of great exception that a Jesuit, uh, after refusing the, the honorific title and St. Ignatius made us take a special vow to avoid those things, certainly not seeking them, only reluctantly accepting them on a second or third offer and with legitimate uh, permission of our legitimate superiors. So there's a long history of Jesuits fleeing the purple, fleeing the red, trying not to have anything to do with these church offices. And it's the best of our tradition. Cardinal uh, Bellarmine, uh, way back in, I think, the, the election of 1605, he had reluctantly become a cardinal, first of the great modern ecclesiologists, and a Jesuit from, um, from Italy. And he um, received votes, at two numerous votes, at two consecutive papal conclaves, including the very contentious 1605 conclave. And he uh, rep reputedly went away muttering, Lord, save me from the papacy. He didn't want to be the pope, he wasn't the pope, and we all praise that. So, uh, you know, there have been uh, popes who came from religious orders as recently as 1831. They're usually uh, Benedictines or even a couple of Franciscans thrown in there. But the Jesuits never had one, and uh, it was probably a good thing. Um, so that, that's the kind of uh, background. What does Bergoglio, this, this Jesuit and this um, uh, Arch Cardinal Archbishop of, Argent of Buenos Aires, Argentina, what does he bring that's distinctive? And in my book and in the article, in, in uh, the book that Paul co-edited, I try to go through a checklist. Now, here we are at a Je uh, Georgetown University, a Jesuit campus, where the Jesuit lingo is hopefully very much in the air. So it, it won't surprise you to use phrase, if I use a phrase like the seeking the majus, or ad maiorum dei gloria, for the greater glory of God, or uh, forming men and women for others. I could go through a list of, of several other uh, kind of Jesuit inside lingo uh, terms. There's a spiritual mindset. There is a, a charism of the Jesuits. And I use uh, several different analogies. It was only after I wrote all these uh, chapters and books about it that I realized I was leaning on a couple of uh, metaphors. One is the Jesuit DNA metaphor. So in Bergoglio, even though he hadn't lived in the Jesuit community since the early 90s, when he became a, a auxiliary bishop in Buenos Aires, then archbishop, uh, he, after going through 15 years of Jesuit formation, being a provincial superior, several other academic posts and superior posts, living with Jesuits uh, for uh, what, 30 or 40 years, that changes you. Going through the 30-day spiritual exercises a couple of times, as he did, as a novice, as a tertium, it really does change you. So one analogy is the Jesuit DNA, the spiritual DNA. Another one is the fingerprints. My friend Chris Lowney, we went to high school together, uses that in his book about Pope Francis, one of the first to come out in 2013. His Jesuit fingerprints are all over the things that he does, especially in social teachings. Concern for the poor, to help souls, and it's a spiritual mind cast that's self-giving at our best, the Ignatius's prayer for generosity, I'll review that, and it's a spiritual, uh, but it's still inner-worldly. It's a, it's a world-transforming spirituality. And my good friend on this campus, Father John O'Malley, uh, has talked so much about that. In his book, The First Jesuits, there's a really good takeaway of what that first generation or so of Jesuits were committed to from the writings of St. Ignatius, the spiritual exercises, the constitutions, the Jesuit sense of mission. And then a third bundle of analogies has to do with water. I published an article uh, this past summer in the Journal of Catholic Social Teaching called, He Drinks from His Own Wells, 
the Jesuit roots of the ethical teachings of Pope Francis, Journal of Catholic Social Teaching, uh, summer of 2018, Villanova University. Drinking from his own wells. Um, that's, uh, I'm borrowing from Bernard of Clairvaux a thousand years ago, from Gustavo Gutierrez about 30 years ago in his famous book, we, we Drink from Our Own Wells, The Spiritual Journeys of a People. And that people is a Latin American church. And we drink from our own wells is an analogy about where do we get the motivation for our actions. It comes from the water we drink, by way of analogy, the spirituality we adopt, and that is ingrained in us in our spiritual practices, like making retreats, following the spiritual exercises. So there's other analogies that you could use. I use streams flowing together. The Argentinian stream that Pope Francis imbibed as a native son of Argentina, uh, Latin American stream, his family stream, the family of recent immigrants from Italy just a few years before his birth. His, his parents came from northern Italy. So all of these analogies hopefully lead us to an appreciation for the complexity, as Paul said, of his thought. And one final thought there. Nothing, nobody should interpret these deterministically. Do you have any psychologists in the room? There's hard and soft determinism. Pope Francis is a free man. He's not to be placed in a box. He's, I would say he's unpredictable. Uh, some people don't like that about him. They like tightly scripted papacies. Think of uh, how he spoke so freely on those back of the airplane impromptu press conferences saying things like, who am I to judge? And, and many other of his sound bites. N nothing about the spiritual roots of these social teachings should be interpreted deterministically. Okay, so I'd like to unpack that a little bit more and apply it to the sort of the political realm. Um, we know that he has railed against human convention in every form, economic structures, political structures, um, uh, religious structures, um, which is interesting that he heads up the largest religious bureaucracy in the world. And he rails against the structures, and, and in particular, he rails against easy human judgments. And so he talks about um, one of his commentaries early on in his papacy, how uh, he railed against the notion of the early Christians, who the wealthy ones discriminated against those who had less in terms of the, the sharing of the Eucharist, and how he argued that we still see that happening. He uh, argues that the church has to be seen more as a field hospital, helping the wounded, and that mercy, in one of his other writings, always triumphs judgment. Let God judge. Let us show mercy to each other. So we see these kinds of things applied. And when he talks like that, all the while affirming traditional Catholic teaching, but then take, making us think in a very different way about uh, religious identity, Catholic religious identity, but generally what a religious person or a follower of Christ or just a religious person, uh, how you would uh, operationalize your faith. You see him making you think differently about the ontological element of, of human existence. So you, in this book, said something that really caught my eye. When you said, we have to understand the structural eye of Pope Francis. This has a political economic element to it. So I'm wondering, what does that mean, and specifically in terms of uh, his identity and the comments I just asked? I'm thinking of uh, copywriting that phrase. It's I don't a good know copywriting. if I was original, but he does have a structural eye. And by way of background, Paul called attention to his unpredictability. He really believes in the culture of encounter that we can and should learn things from other people, especially the poor, um, and that we should keep our eyes open and not have a predetermined uh, uh, conclusion. It's kind of like a good basketball team. Georgetown basketball, which I have supported since the days of Patrick Ewing, my hero. Someday I want to meet Pope Francis, never have, but I really want to meet Patrick Ewing. <laughs> I, I'm a New York Knicks fan, too. This has never happened. I met Clyde Frazier one time, Walt Frazier. Um, but basketball is at its best when a team doesn't have, this is the point of the triangle offense of, of uh, Jordan, doesn't have like, okay, I'm going to pass the ball to you no matter what, even if there's three opposing players in between. Pope Francis is like that. He sees the value, he sees the urgency of keeping an open mind and encountering people on their own terms. And I might say as a Jesuit, this is part of our spirituality. Our spiritual legacy is a discerning one, a flexible one, a pastorally sensitive one, not predetermined answers to questions that you may not even have. 
So that's a, a bedrock that I just want to introduce. The structural eye. Think about all of the things that Pope Francis says by way of policy recommendations. They're not just shoot from the hip answers. They are deliberative. He wrote, by the way, three of the longest documents in papal history. So Laudato Si, 40,000 words. That's an encyclical. That's pretty long. But he topped that with Amoris Laetitia, over 60,000, and Evangelii Gaudium, his first major uh, document, November of 2013, an apostolic exhortation, which is about 60,000 words, too. In those long, tortuous texts, and he probably needs an editor. He put, like, every thought he ever had on homily preparation in Evangelii Gaudium. He put lots of pastoral advice, uh, exegesis of 1 Corinthians 13 in Amoris Laetitia. Could use an editor. But he is, as uh, the question from Paul Manuel suggests, he's looking at root causes of social problems, the structures, economic, political, and cultural structures that cause our problems today. Do you remember his uh, soundbite from Evangelii Gaudium in uh, 2013? It's uh, paragraph 52. Inequality is the root of so many social injustices. Inequality is the root of things. So he's looking for what is causing suffering in the world today. What are the roots? Very often the roots are in the greed of people, compiling wealth, hoarding wealth, not sharing the wealth. Uh, very often it's in mistreatment of, of uh, workers, failure to, um, to have a labor uh, market that makes sense for people's needs, that r excludes people. That's his big word, exclusion. I don't believe any previous pope used that word as frequently. Uh, in the environment, there are root causes of the environmental crisis that are, uh, and he says, anthropological in nature. Not just, oh, I, I'm careless, I throw a wrapper on the ground. I'm not thinking in the right way about the human person and his or her place in creation. The root is anthropocentris, uh, tyrannical anthropocentrism. And the same is for the family, the same is for our lack of attention to peacemaking and reconciliation, and certainly for our treatment of refugees. Root anthropological uh, crises or, or mistakes are at the root of the structures of injustice. So a structural eye. Let's get below the surface. Let's delve a little deeper. People sometimes say, oh, it sounds like Marx. Well, if part of Marxism is to ask hard questions, to conduct social analysis that's rigorous, Let's embrace that part of Marx. And by the way, Pope Paul VI said that in 1971. OK, so now we're getting somewhere. Um, as a political scientist who studies religion and politics, I have to tell you that most of my conferences I've been going to, academic conferences since the election, um, if it's come up once, it's come up a million times, uh, is this Pope a Marxist? Is this Pope a progressive? Is this Pope um, something we've never seen before? From that point, from a political characterization, people w desperately want to put them into a box. Uh, of those you know, political scientists like absolutes, and we like absolute numbers, and we like absolute boxes. You can't do that with this guy. He doesn't fit into that. And so there's this amazing article uh, that helped me a lot to understand him um, in Theological Studies, authored by one of his teachers in Argentina, uh, Juan Carlos Galoni. And the article was called Pope Francis and the Theology of the People. And in that article, he cited what he called, or he dubbed, four Begolian priorities. He said, you have to think about him as a priority because this pope is not someone you place into a box, but he's very much a process-oriented individual. Again, a concrete as opposed to abstract. And let me just go quickly. One of them is time is greater than space. One is unity prevails over conflict. One is realities are more important than ideas. And the whole is greater than the part. So as I was reflecting on those priorities, and I looked at your most recent book, I thought maybe you could help us connect the things by um, uh, helping us understand what motivates him in terms of peacemaking. Now, blessed you know, uh, uh, are the peacemakers. We know that. But why does this pope spend so much time on the migrant, on the, on the marginalized, on those suffering? What is it about his priorities that brings a, him to an understanding of peacemaking? And by the way, those four axioms which appear in Evangelii Gaudium, so 2013, which was a programmatic, uh, most popes published a first 
um, a publication, it's usually called an apostolic exhortation, that is, um, that is programmatic. So he was laying out the priorities for his papacy, and he pulled out of his notes, because he had used those uh, four axioms in earlier writings in Argentina uh, decades before. So uh, he was laying out his priorities. Again, don't think you can put him in a box based on those four. But they are, they are indicative of his broadness of his concern. So on peacemaking, um, I, I did a fair, first of all, when I wrote the book, Mercy in Action, I thought of the peacemaking as just a little coda. Maybe it would be part of the conclusion, two or three pages. And I started compiling all the amazing thing he is, things he has done in diplo uh, diplomacy, peacemaking, his, his opening to, uh, uh, to help uh, President Obama and Raul C Castro in 2014 get Cuban-American relations back on target, which of course have fallen by the wayside, but it looked promising at that time. Uh, trying to mediate a, a resolution between um, the Palestinian Authority and the Jewish state. He had the, the leaders of those two groups, uh, Abbas and Perez, in the Vatican Garden praying together. Uh, in Syria, he had the Pray for Peace hashtag. He had a vigil in September of 2013, urging the allies not to bomb uh, more parts of Syria. So uh, I, I go through a much longer list, uh, going to Central African Republic and the mosque in Bangui, going to, to Egypt and talking uh, about uh, terrorism in the Middle East and actually scolding Sisi, the, the head of state of uh, Egypt, about human rights. So amazing amounts of things. What's behind it? So what are the, the structural elements behind it? I'll give you the thumbnail account. Looking back at Jesuit history, looking back at the heritage that the Jesuits have, um, have taken forward, in the very constitutions of the Society of Jesus, which St. Ignatius wrote in the last years of his life, um, there's, uh, part seven is about our selection of ministries. And kind of lost in the list, it's kind of a laundry list, things we should be doing, giving retreats, sharing the spiritual exercises, ministries of the word, some educational ministries, although su surprisingly, that was really not high on the list for St. Ignatius. It, it's turned out that way. But one of the lost items is the reconciliation of quarreling parties. That's the um, translation of Gans and also of John O'Malley on this campus, who taught me everything I know about part seven of the Constitutions from his great book, The First Jesuits. The, the reconciliation of quarreling parties. Did you ever read Romeo and Juliet? The Capulets and the Montagues in Verona, hmm. Italy. That was a very common situation in Italy, certainly the peninsula of Italy, but all over Western Europe at that time. The Reformation had just happened a, a generation earlier. Catholics and Protestants were fighting, but also within the Catholic family, many families, many tribes, many uh, you know, uh, groups um, would be at each other's throats. And so that was part. The Je every priest, but especially Jesuits, are missioned to be ministers of reconciliation. Why did he name himself Francis? It's for Francis of Assisi, 12th century saint, founder of a great order, a, a family of orders, in fact, the Franciscan family. And one, uh, Francis of Assisi is known as the patron saint of creation because he loved the animals, and we still celebrate uh, the blessing of the animals on October 4th, the Feast of St. Francis every year. He is the patron saint of the poor, the poverello, the, the poor little man from central Italy. But the third thing he's known for is peacemaking. And we all know the peace prayer of St. Francis, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. But we also may have forgotten that in 1219, Francis of Assisi got in some kind of a boat with just one other Franciscan brother. They somehow found their way across from Italy, across the Mediterranean to Egypt, found their way to Damietta, this town where the Sultan lived, and met for weeks with him, could have been killed at any point, trying to negotiate an end to the Crusades, the murderous, bloody battles between Christians and Muslims. Peacekeeping mission, the first of its kind, as far as I could tell, didn't really end the Crusades. But I do believe it gave impetus, it gave a model, an inspiration for all future interreligious dialogue geared towards peace. And Pope Francis is consciously following in the footsteps of St. Francis, his namesake, and he, he made his own trip from Italy to Egypt not that long ago and talked to uh, Muslim leaders about the possibility of peacemaking.
So I'd like to open it up um, for uh, questions from the audience. But before I do that, I have one final question about bringing it home to Georgetown University and what this means. And Georgetown is a very special place. It's a, obviously a Jesuit university. It's a place um, where we cultivate these kinds of questions. Um, when I worked on my uh, doctorate in the government department here, I actually was Father Charles' uh, TA. He was fantastic. I learned a lot about these questions. Um, and um, on a personal note, my wife happened to be born at Georgetown University Hospital and got her doctorate. Now she's in the government department. So it's a long family. <laughs> and we do talk about, with our children, curry personales quite a bit. We talk about uh, Ad Majorum de Gloria, and we talk about these things. And so now that we have a Jesuit pope, I'm simply wondering, uh, at you as a Jesuit, uh, what kind of advice you could give to Georgetown University about how Francis can inspire or affirm or deepen the work that they already do? I'll give you a short answer with a, a checklist of three items, OK? Uh, three things that Pope Francis reminds us of and that this campus, I think it's already doing great on all these from what I know of Georgetown, more than just the basketball team. But uh, <laughs> word has spread. Georgetown, a lot of good things are happening on this very special campus. Here's a checklist. See if you can do even better. Do you know that St. Ignatius' spiritual exercises are divided into four weeks or, or stages? The final week has a meditation, or it's called a contemplation to attain divine love, sometimes translated differently. And the opening line of it is, love shows itself more in deeds than in words. Can we get beyond the lip service? And by the way, I'm preaching to myself here because I have a lot of lip service to principles of social justice and just loving the poor. And do I do enough about it? No. Does Georgetown, for all of its lofty ideals, do enough to pursue uh, a really super agenda of loving one's neighbor as oneself, and especially the poor, vulnerable, and marginalized? Well, I don't know the answer, so only you can look into your hearts and answer that. Pope Francis would encourage us to do more. So there's a little bit of, um, of uh, of, of a challenge. And the second one is a phrase that Paul just quoted, the majus. Never be satisfied with what you've done so far. St. Ignatius had, er, earlier in the spiritual exercises, had a series of questions. What have these saints, uh, Francis and Dominic, done for Christ? What can I do for Christ? What have I done in the past? What can I do better in the future? That's the heart of the majus. A restlessness, a spiritual restlessness, that ur eggs us on, urges us on to do more, to serve humankind ever greater. And so if you're a faculty member, think of how you can inspire students to take up that majus. And the third one, uh, we, we haven't talked much about the um, in pol political involvements. But if you know any Jesuits at all, we are all, uh, I'll speak for most of us anyway, are very interested in translating our spiritual heritage, the great inheritance that we have, it's a treasure, into political activism. So, uh, and, and by the way, Pope Francis has a very good quote that he was using in Argentina, especially against the um, Nestor, um, Kirchner. Uh, the, the Kirchner government. A good Catholic meddles in politics, okay? So don't be afraid if you're a good Catholic to meddle in politics. So make that your, uh, Georgetown is so well poised, like no other of the 28 Jesuit campuses. You're so close to the corridors of power here in Washington. Can I give you a scoop? I found this out two days ago through America Magazine. You can look this up on their website. We have some former America editors and writers in this room. I'm one myself. Um, so um, every year, the, the sitting pope publishes a World Day for Peace message, January 1st of every year is the World Day of Peace. So Pope Francis has had five, six of these now. And his next one, the World Day of Peace message for January 1st, 2019, it'll be released around December 8th, usually three weeks in advance, deals with, and here's the scoop, it deals with this theme, good politics and mutual trust. So it's a World Day of Peace message, so it will be about peace. But he's going to make the argument, I guess it's more structural, I hear, that peacemaking, peace building, conflict transformation, to use the more embracing uh, term, is built on good politics, constructive kinds of politics, built on mutual trust that's a little different from the contentiousness we've seen, 
the nationalism we've seen, the um, heightened rhetoric and polarization, the partisan divisions that we've seen in this country, but it's not just the U.S. So that, I think, a good Catholic meddles in politics and is willing to challenge politicians and parties and regimes to reach across the aisle and have good politics based on mutual Thank you, Tom. So I think at this point we can go around the room. We have a microphone. And so uh, if you have a question, just get Sarah's attention and she'll give you the microphone. And Of course, I will have lots of comments uh, and feedback for you because I'm originally from Argentina. So, and I actually happen to know Pope Francis. Um, so it's a privilege. And <clears throat> I'm also a, a graduate of the Law Center here, so I'm a proud Hoya. <laughs> um, so my work for the past two decades has been uh, uh, in, the, in the field of peace building, uh, governance, rule of law, human rights uh, across the Americas. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, I, I had a, a direct uh, um, contact over the years um, with Pope Francis in Argentina. And you said at the beginning uh, uh, of your presentation, Father, that uh, what were we all doing that day that was announced, no, that he was selected, no? And I remember I was having a, <clears throat> a senior team meeting with my former colleagues here in Washington, D.C., where I've been living for the past 15 years. And, um, and I got a call from my great aunt from Argentina, 86 years old, telling me because I didn't know. So I had to get out of the meeting and then I came back and I told my colleagues and one of my colleagues said, oh yes, but you know, and I was so excited, no? And he said, but you, but you know, Lelia, um, he's not gonna be able to do much being from, you know, a Latin American country. And I always think about that, and it's it's so it's so um, um, it's moving um, to see everything he has been able to accomplish um, so far. And uh, and I always connect this to um, you know my work and the conversations that happen here in Washington D.C. vis-à-vis -vis what we do you know in the field, no? Because here with conversations are you know or what's happening in the fields, no? It's in Argentina or in Guatemala or in South Sudan, no? For us that work in development and peace building. And, uh, and so sometimes I, I, I've over, I also question myself uh, thinking that it's quite uh, um, pejorative at the same time, no? But the question is the reality of Pope Francis um, or Juan Carlos Bergoglio is that he is a man as I know him, and as I had the pleasure to, to see him, with common sense, no? With reality, no? Someone that um, traveled in the metro every day to work, uh, that was not afraid, as you said, you know, of encountering others and working at what we call in Argentina, Villas Miserias, which are like uh, what we call in Brazil, favelas, or, you know, where the poorest of the poor live. And that's where he worked. No, so he was not afraid of doing that and bringing, bringing um, the church, but bringing the teachings of, of Jesus, no, and making them a reality, which is something that I personally criticize, no, to the Catholic Church, and I think it, it challenges all of us, um, men and women for others, no, to really. Um, help transform the realities that, that we're thinking. I think he's, that's one of his uh, major legacies that hopefully will continue, no? Uh, he's, he's someone very controversial in Argentina today, uh, as you probably know, um, politically speaking, um, uh, dealing with local politics. But the message is, for me, it's we can have fantastic conversations and reflection. It's fantastic that all these books and reflections are being developed for him. But I want, you know, I always say that I want people to understand that it's about common sense. And for me, he has the smarts of the Jesuits and, and the heart of a Franciscan, no? And that is, uh, that's how I like describing him. Um, and, 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 and he has been able to bring that along. So it's my comment. Thank you for your work and for taking the time to, to reflect on, on him. Now 
it's an honor to, to be in the room with someone who knows uh, Bergoglio before he became Francis. And let me just add one thing, and I've pretty much said it already. Um, he is exceptional in his um, spontan spontaneous response to people, and you see it in settings. Uh, on the cover of my book, which Paul will hold up, is a picture of him in Lesbos, Greece in 2016, April 2016, when he went. And you all know the story of how he went to Lampedusa, that island of tears off the coast of Sicily and Africa uh, also. So he has the, the uh, remember the phrase that he uses, the culture of encounter and the culture of accompaniment. So being on the ground with people and meeting them <coughs> face to face is a very high priority for him. Let me say one more thing about that and your comment suggested it. I've admired all of our recent popes. I was born during the papacy of John XXIII, deservingly sainted. Paul VI, so inspiring in many ways, the author of Papa Lauren Progressio. John Paul I, we barely got to know him, but John Paul II and, and um, Benedict XVI, they were all excellent popes. But think about what Francis brings, that none of them quite had extensive pastoral experience walking around the favelas, the uh, Villas Miserias, and really see, oh, he was a, well, now I'm going to get the Spanish wrong, was he a obispo callero, right? Yeah. A bishop who walked the streets, mm -hmm. rode the, the buses. Yeah. So those qualities, for me, especially around his, his work with families and, and meeting the needs of families that have been broken up in um, some cases of abuse and other, other problems facing families, the mercy he's shown, and that's the word, the merciful reaction is, a, for me, a function of his background, which other popes recent haven't been able to pull out uh, to take advantage of, of being a pastoral minister. Hi. Uh, I teach at Georgetown, but I'm also finishing my PhD at American um, at School of International Service and I'm looking at the impact of religious advocacy on U.S. foreign policy. Needless to say, the Cuban situation is one of my cases. So I have two questions. <clears throat> the, the main question is, why in the world would he bother with the relationship between U.S. and Cuba at the time that he did? Um, and the second question is, there seems to be a pretty good connection between him and Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston, and I'm sure some of it's personality, um, but I also think that some of it is that Franciscan connection, um, and I'd like your opinion on that. Uh, I, I have shaken the hand of Sean O'Malley, and I would like to shake the hand of Pope Francis someday, so, uh, but I, I don't know enough about their uh, connection. Uh, it, it, all, everyone around this table probably knows that Cardinal O'Malley is on that inner circle of the Pope's advisors, the, the Council of Eight, or now Nine Cardinals, is, is it seven or eight? Is it eight? Nine. It's now nine. So, and I have had the honor of meeting uh, uh, Cardinal Maradiaga of Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Uh, oh, and, and uh, Marx, I guess I've met a few of the Cardinal uh, Marx of, um, of, of, of Germany. But um, I do believe he leans upon uh, Sean O'Malley for many things, especially around the sex abuse crisis. Cardinal O'Malley has cleaned up a lot of problems, but of course, that, that's a relative thing. The problem has not been cleaned up anywhere uh, fully. The, the Cuba question is interesting, and I don't have an, a great amount of insight, but could, will you allow me to be to put on my psychologist hat for a second? Do you, uh, do you know family systems theory? So I was a middle child. Middle children are supposed to be the peacemakers, right? The older and the younger, and you're in the bridge, and you're trying to make everybody happy, and the relationship. I believe that Pope Francis, regardless of the birth order of his family, I don't think he was third out of five, I think he was second out of five. Regardless of that, he, he looks like a middle child to me. He wants to make peace. And when he surveyed his home region, Latin America, he could easily see in 2014 or any other time that a 50 plus year um, standoff, a stalemate, impasse, between two very influential countries in the Western Hemisphere, the United States and Cuba, should not be allowed to fester. And so I believe that he must have had some back channel with the Obama administration. Uh, by the way, President Obama in December of 2013 said inequality is the root of all social evils. 
a month after Pope Francis said it in Evangelii Gaudium. So I believe that there's kind of a, a two-step between uh, the presidency of Obama taking some moral leadership from the early years of Pope Francis. That's an aside. But in the case of Cuba, I really believe that Pope Francis was, uh, I'll even use the psychological word, driven or motivated by a desire to make peace. In one of the, and I think it was Elizabeth, Elizabeth de Piquet, a, a journalist from Argentina, I believe it was in the back of her book, or maybe Paul Valelli's book, or um, I, I read two, uh, Austin Ivory's book, one of those biographies. Somebody dug up a letter that, oh, as a matter of fact, I think it was Shriver mm -hmm. uh, who wrote his book about a pilgrimage about Pope Francis, uh, dug up a letter that Pope Francis wrote to a priest friend of his that was, it came to light probably uh, uh, surreptitiously or roundabout way, in which he relayed the pain that he, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, felt as a young boy when members of his large extended family, now Italian, Argentinian, I'm an Italian American, I think my family, the same size as his, also five children, large extended family, there were always arguments going on in my family. It was a rambunctious, arguing family. And I know what it feels like, maybe I have a bit of the middle child in me too, to want to make peace, but you're eight or 10 years old, you can't do that. He said in that letter, Pope Francis did, that he went to bed crying very often because his uncles and cousins and siblings were arguing too much. So I believe that Pope Francis has the heart of a peacemaker, of a peace builder. And he wants to build the structures that will lead countries to make peace and some of those structures are to have normal diplomatic relations, precisely what's been missing between the US and Cuba all these years. So there's a little psychological insight. I hope that finds its way into your dissertation at American University. Good luck. Uh, but that's a bit of insight. Hi, my name is William Whalen. Um, I have a question for you. And it actually, it comes out of uh, sort of the Pope's uh, understanding and perspective, if you will, on uh, Oscar Romero, Rutilio Grande, and of course, we know that he said recently at the canonization that Rutilio Grande, Grande was going to be next. Um, and you know, reading what he had to say here and various things about Romero and what the Pope has said about Romero, it seems to me that reflects, and I could be wrong, but it reflects a, kind of a reimagining of what it means to be a Christian. Because what he talks about when he talks about Romero is that he's a new form of martyr. It's a different type of martyrdom than we've experienced in the church. And he talks about the fact that people that basically accused Romero of being you know, on the left or on the right, or accused him from the left or from the right, were basically martyring him again. And in fact, even those in the church that are, were holding up the, and perhaps I'm wrong on this, but those that were basically skeptical of Romero's uh, suitability for canonization were also, in some sense, martyring Romero again. And so there's a whole, seems to me, a, a reimagining of what, of what a Christian really is. And it, a lot of it has to do with the issue of, are we courageous enough to follow the gospel? Are we courageous enough to lay our life down for our friends, as obviously, in an extreme form, Romero and Grandi and others did? But I'm wondering if you could comment on that, because in my final point is that what's interesting is the three letters that we've seen from the pro Pope, where he talks about the issue of the family of the church and how we look at ourselves as a community in the church, how we look at the environment and creation and how we look at the family, those three core ingredients were also central to Romero's ministry and what Francis had to say about Romero's ministry. So I'm wondering if you could talk about whether in fact one of the most revolutionary, potentially revolutionary things that Francis will give us because of his Jesuit charism and background is a reimagining and a reminder to us of what it really truly means to be a Christian. Well, uh, wonderful, it, it was so eloquent that I could barely uh, add to it. But let me add a couple of elements. Uh, so first of all, the Romero, the, 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 the uh, scholarship around Romero is a bit of a minefield. Uh, you indicated that in your question. People uh, uh, questioning uh, the significance of his life, whether he really had a conversion or not, uh, and what that meant and his political involvements. Of course, it's no 
coincidence that he was martyred in March of 1980 on the day after shot with a high-powered rifle through a chapel window uh, at the Divine Mercy Hospital, uh, saying mass for the sisters there. No accident that it was the previous day that he called upon in a radio address, I believe, to the soldiers, to the paramilitary, to put down your guns and stop. He said, I plead to you by the blood of Christ to stop uh, kill, uh, killing. So no accident there. So open-ended questions. Did he have a conversion, as some people say, so that, that when his friend Rutilio Grande, the Jesuit, ministering in El Piasnal, a small town, was, was killed, and he went there and witnessed it, uh, did that change a, a lethargic person, an apathetic person, into an active uh, social activist bishop? There's lots of evidence that he, he was already well along the road of social concern. So it's not an all or nothing. And by the way, the same question is, did, uh, and the biographies of Bergoglio point this out, did Bergoglio undergo a conversion when he was kind of exiled, internal exile, uh, by a, an assignment by his Jesuit provincial out of the corridors of power when he went to um, Cordoba instead of being in uh, Buenos Aires most of his life. So th these are open-ended questions for hermeneutics and biographers to settle. But I do like the way your question asks us to think about the meaning of martyrdom. The word martyr mar comes from the Greek word martyrion, to, to witness, witness to the faith. Can we, and I also like the way your question used the word moral imagination, can we elicit the moral imagination that will allow us a broader sense of what it means to witness to Christ in the world today. Some of that witnessing will be political activism. Some of it will be spiritual activism. Some of it will look like just kind of nickel and dime type of, of charitable works, the works of mercy. There are many saints who have not been recognized by the church. And I would venture to say millions of people, even though we've canonized thousands in recent years. John Paul II himself canonized more people than any other pope, and maybe all the popes before him put together. So can we use our moral imagination to expand the meaning of martyrdom, the literal martyrdoms of, an, of a Romero and a Rutillo Grande, uh, but also the sense of we all witnessing to our lives? So typically, we declare someone a martyr because they have been the victim of an act of violence uh, 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 pointed against the church with hatred of the church, of the Christian faith. But I think that in our world today, we need to invoke our imagination and have an even broader sense of what it means to give to the point of death uh, for the church. So all of those questions uh, deserve uh, the attention that you so rightly put forward as really important further investigation, especially around Romero. Thank you. Tom, thanks for your uh, great commentary here. Uh, following up on some of this, <clears throat> you know, Pope Francis has set out, um, I think, a great vision, a very deep one. It's going to take us a long time to, uh, like, decode and think about it. But I'm concerned, obviously, about things like the sex abuse scandal, the actually orchestrated attempts now, I think, by some to undermine his papacy, uh, the growth of nationalism, these kinds of things, and I'm wondering, with his charisms, you know, will it, will he still be able to maintain a witness, you know, with moving in these new directions, or how will this hamper or complicate, and uh, you know, this type of thing? Bishops' meeting is next week, and you know, they're going to be putting out a statement on racism. You know, maybe we're going to find it on section C, you know, <laughs> 14 or something, because of the of the other stuff going on. Thanks. Well. I'm continually amazed that he is as energetic at the age of 70. Oh, yeah, it's over 80 now. He was born in 1936, so do the math. At his advanced age, 81, 82, uh, how he could maintain the energy he has. Can I get pious with you for a moment? It can only be the work, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I get discouraged when something goes wrong, like when I was stuck uh, on an Amtrak yesterday for 90 minutes and didn't move an inch in central New Jersey. He, nothing seems to bother him. Uh, and maybe this is a spiritual lesson for all of us. Can we learn how not to be discouraged? We hear so much about the spate of suicides of young people today, especially parts of the world where the economy is bad. I believe South Korea has the highest incident of teenage suicide in the world. And it's really tied to the economy, to people uh, having to kind of you know, 
hardly ever get a chance for employment at a young age. And so many people turn to des desperation and suicide. Pope Francis has the opposite of that. He has plenty of reasons to be uh, desperate and concerned and discouraged, and yet he does not. So I agree. There's every reason for him to be discouraged, and yet every indication I have, every time you see him in a press conference, he's smiling. Every time he, some new bundle of uh, problems creeps up, especially in the sex abuse crisis, new revelations this summer from the United States, but many other countries as well. He takes it not as discouragement, but to renew his energy and to kick more life, both into the internal life of the church and into external teachings on social justice. So, Walt, you're absolutely right. The US bishops are gonna be meeting this week, this coming week, and they may be discouraged, but they have a leader in Rome who has shown no signs of being discouraged, even at an advanced age. Tom, can you say a bit about uh, the Jesuit roots of, of Francis's uh, institutional critique of the church uh, as clericalism being the besetting sin? And secondly, do those same roots preclude him from being able to lead the diocesan clergy out of that problem of clericalism? Well, I, I would uh, you know, identify clericalism as maybe the key. You know, the, there's many isms that are bad in the world, and there's racism and classism and, and sexism. But when you're talking about internal church matters, I think you're correct, Drew, to point out that clericalism seems to be a root uh, social sin or structural evil, however you want to phrase that. Um, is there something about a religious order, so a priest from a religious order, first one to be pope since 1831 or so, uh, that is promising or can inspire a change of that sinful mindset of privilege and secrecy and lack of transparency? Um, you know, without a sense of hubris, I like to think that somebody from a religious tradition with a charism, a spirituality that's not just about propping up an institution, but about bringing, the, again, a spirit-filled uh, charism into the church has a chance to, to break that. However, we all know that there's a, a backlash, because he really is, you know, a, a, when, a, when a bishop comes into a diocese from the outside, there's always a little you know, dance of distrust, mistrust, and especially when it's a religious order. I saw this when, uh, when uh, uh, Cardinal O'Malley came into the Boston Archdiocese. I was living in Boston when he came in. And lots of fanfare, and yet the rumor was a local diocesan priest somewhat resented him being there and having all the power over them. So sure, it comes, it's a double-edged sword. A, a, a fresh voice from the outside, both geographically, but also in a spiritual tradition, whether it's the Jesuits, the Franciscans, or the Carmelites, coming in, being able to challenge the local clergy to uh, leave aside clericalism. But the possibility, as your question hinted, of a backlash, a lack of trust, that there's more work to do. If I had one wish for the church, it would be that everybody would take seriously his, the, the two analogies that have been quoted, actually, in the questions here. The pastor should have the smell of the sheep, be close to the people, the culture of accompaniment that Pope Francis talks about, and the field battle, the field hospital after battle analogy that Pope Francis loves to use and that reminds us that the church's mission is to patch up hurting people, people who, are, who have injuries, and whether that's in families because of irregular situations or because of social injustices or conflict and need reconciliation, all, uh, all of those, the hurting parts of our reality, including the environment, if we could keep those in mind, then I think that's a reminder of the values that would offset clericalism. It's not about who's up in the church hierarchy, careerism. It's about a hierarchy of service. Who can be a better servant, the best servant they could be? And there's the modus once again. What more can I do? So that could be a, 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 the key that unlocks the sin of clericalism. It's, for me, it's certainly the pivotal moment. Now, as we finish up, I'd like to thank Sarah and the Berkeley Center that made this possible. Uh, Tom's going to be around a little bit longer for any questions you might have. I'd like to thank you for participating in wonderful questions, and thanks to Tom for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.